Hi, I'm Brian Whipker. I'm at NC State University, and today we're going to talk about PGR tips for northern growers. So these are recommendations that we're looking at for the northern tier of the state, uh, state United States, uh, versus rates that would be more common here in the south where we do higher rates than you all do up in the north. So what we're going to go over today are, uh, is an introduction on some background with PGRs and then some specific items that Garrett and I talked about that we thought that would apply at this point in time in production to help you with what's going on in, in your Michigan or northern greenhouse. So we're going to do overcoming overdoses and enhancing plant growth low or late season drench applications, and then balancing the phosphorus level with the PGR applications, because you do get growth control or lack of uh, stimulation of growth if you go on a low phosphorus diet for those plants. So those are basically what we're gonna talk about, and these are directly applicable to your situation of growing plants currently in the greenhouse. So, just a brief overview as far as what PGRs are available. Now, if you go to the FINE website, you can get the new guide, which is the perennial guide that Joyce Latimer is the head of. Uh, it just came out in January. And then the, the annual one came out last spring. So Joyce and I alternate years as far as updating one or the other. And both of them are available as PDFs uh, from the Fine Americas website. It was also sent out as a link uh, earlier on when we did some PGR University information. Uh, if you're at most trade shows and there's a fine booth, they will have the guides there because all of the marketing reps uh, have a, a good supply of those guides. So when you're looking at different types of PGRs within, this is the, the annual guides. Uh, there's a number of them listed. This is just page six that's there, highlighting the table. So I will use the 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 chemical name versus the product name very uh, very often. So if I say paclobutrazol, you know, Bonsai Piccolo 10X uh, is common. Dimenazide is Dazide or B9. Uh, Asimidol is abide or rest. And so anyway, I'll, I'll go back and forth, but th th these are the chemical names and with so many different chemicals available or products available from different greenhouses, this would be a guide for what you can uh, look at for as far as what information's there. In addition on this article, just to point out, we go over some of the chemicals and what they're used for. So that's basic information. And if you've been using PGRs all along, you, 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 this, this might not be what you're really looking for, but just in case there's more people who are looking at uh, from the beginner standpoint. In addition, we made this attributes table. And so specifically, if we're looking at Paclobutrazol, which is like Piccolo 10XE or our bonsai, you can see the percentages that are there, how the level, relative level of activity that you get. So is it a stronger PGR or a weaker one? And then the application types, the chemical absorption, uh, when it, you know, how easy it goes in the plant, how quickly it goes. Cause you know, if you, you apply a chemical and say, then someone turns on overhead irrigation, did it wash it off or is it still potentially there? So it's that type of information and background that this table might come in handy on when you have some of those questions. So it's in there. So, you know, for those who have been doing PGRs that this type of information and this this figure is probably not needed, but just to to give the background before we go into more specific applications. When you're looking at the relative strengths of PGRs, I like to divide it up based on foliar sprays and then drenches because it, it, they they vary a little. So you know, dimenazide, B9, Chlormaquat, Cyclocell, Ethafons, Florel. Those are the, the milder ones, so you might have to do multiple applications to get the effect. Asimidol is a rest or a, uh, uh, abide. Great chemical, higher cost, but you know, pro to me it's the go-to chemical for plugs. It has enough activity, uh, but it's not too strong, so that's a great one. Fluoroprimidol is top floor. Paclo is the bonsai, piccolo, uniconazole, Sue magic. So as foliar sprays, they're a little stronger. 
when it comes down to uh, drenches, you can use cyclocell. They use it in Europe. You don't want to because it's too expensive and you, you have to use a ton of chemical. It's not e economically feasible to use it. But ARES Abide as a drench works pretty well, but cost-wise, your go-to chemicals are going to be probably Paclo, uh, um, Fluoroprimidol, and Uniconazole, just because the activity's there and you can cut down the dose very low, like a 0.1 part per million, and get great results. And, and the cost per treatment is, is almost nothing. Now, if you notice on the list, I don't have on drenches, I don't have ethafine because it's not registered and it probably at the current point, uh, you're not gonna see a company willing to invest the money into it. It's too expensive to get it registered and you don't see dimenazide. Uh, while it does have root activity, it is tied up by the soil. So you wouldn't use a B9 as a drench. So that gives you a kind of the relative idea of the strength of the PGRs for some people that might be starting out with PGRs. And so there are distinctive niches where some chemicals work better than others on crops. And we can discuss that in the questions at the end if you have specific questions about that uh, for what's happening. But for the most part, when you look at what's going on in the northern area, you're looking for the milder chemicals. Applying something so you don't have too much control and then it might wear off and you have to apply it again. The only thing that might come in is that if you have crops that you're always having to hit in times of constraint when you, you start getting in the closer to shipping season, something like paclobutrazole is something that you might want to end up considering, especially low dose drenches. And we'll go over some of that on some of the, the next three sections that we're going to talk about. And then finally on that PGR guide, there's a, there's a bunch of pages with rates of highlighted adjuratums. So, so look at that rate range. So um, let's go to Piccolo. It says um, Piccolo, Bonsai, Paxol, 15 to 45 part per million. Well, 45 is going to be further south and 15 is going to be a rate that you would consider more for Michigan. So you all need to always go to the lo lower rate range, especially when you're getting started on some of these PGRs to make sure that they work for you and you don't overdose. We, can ha we have ways to overcome that, but with your cloudy weather, the cooler temperatures, you got to go on the milder zone. And so I came up with this graphic here just to illustrate coming off adjusting the rates. So of course, what would you consider? And I should have put a star there, but, but I consider that middle band as the normal band. That's, that's North Carolina, especially when rates are considered. And then from there, you have them for the more northern or you double it for more south. We're the norm, everything else is, is an adjustment. So I know that uh, when, when Jim Barrett was still uh, working at Florida, we would, we would banter back and forth and that's what I would tell him that uh, uh, NC State rates that we determine are the national norms and everything else gets adjusted. So anyway, that's that just some, some infighting and kidding that went on with the PGR people. So, so again, if you take this principle of doing a lower rate, that's going to be um, um, what you need to consider for the North, for Michigan in particular. And, and then you can make your adjustments each year on a particular species cultivar of how they're reacting and how you can make those adjustments for what's going on. So that gave you some background information. Uh, there were some questions that were asked. And so that's, that's I, I wanted to go over that, that background information. And so now let's shift to some areas that I think that uh, are things to keep in mind that you can end up doing if, if you run into this situation this spring to help you specifically with, with production. So I've combined overcoming overdoses and enhancing plant growth. Uh, I've presented some of this information in other webinars, so it might be a repeat for some of you, but others might not. So I wanted to go over this just to keep in mind what is the potential. We Because we think 
of a PGR of controlling growth, but we have enough in the toolbox that we can also stimulate growth. So you got a lot of tools in your toolbox to, to customize and manage that growth for those plants. Uh, so that's what we're gonna kind of cover in this section. So you can have stunted growth with an overdose application. As you can see here with the moms, I think these were nailed with a very high dose of uh, fluoroprimidol uh, in, in a North Carolina operation. Uh, two falls ago. And so when you have that slowed growth or stalled growth, how do you overcome that? And, and when you look at that stalled growth, there are a number of factors. You know, the plants might be small because of lack of fertilization. It could be suboptimal temperatures. It could be cloudy weather or more commonly plant growth regulator overdoses. And so you can stimulate a little growth that's there. Now, now what I'm gonna be talking about really is a little more for, for growth regulator overdoses, a little less for the other factors, but you also can jumpstart those too. So it's, you know, you're really, it's, it's suboptimal growing and it's PGR overdose or two different factors, but the same set of chemicals and what you do works the same. So when you look at growth promotion, what's registered? There are two sets of chemicals. One is a straight GA3, uh, I, uh, I always forget, Florigib and um, uh, Pro, uh, Jib Pro, I, I always forget the name. Those are registered. Uh, do people use them? Not really, even though they're registered. Now, if you want to stimulate growth on a plant for, for tree production, for standards, it's a great go-to chemical. But the margin of error on that is a lot more uh, than going to a combination product that is the combination of 6BA and GA47. The GA is slightly different than the other product. And what we're looking at is Fresco from Fine and Fascination is from, uh, uh, it's a, it was a valent product now with New Farm. Both of those are excellent chemicals. Uh, they work the same. And so when you look at application methods, both are registered as foliar sprays, but only Fresco is registered for substrate drenches or as chemigation. So depending on what, what type of, of application you're gonna make, you're gonna have to pick one or the other if you're gonna get into the drench application. It's gonna have to be a fresco application. So when you're looking at applications, what's on the label, basically a foliar spray is on both labels, one to five part per million. So begin with a lower rate, make an application, wait five, seven days to see whether or not you stimulated the growth to happen. And if not, typically people will come with a half rate again, just to try to jumpstart. The problem is, it's like having a manual car. It's like, it, it, well, it's brake, it's gas, it's brake, it's gas. Which way are you at? And you very quickly can jump start on, on and have too much growth. So you're kind of playing a game. And the game is, is if it was overdosed, how high it was overdosed, the species and the cultivar. So all those factors are, you're playing a little with what's going on to get things to jump and go. But you can get that to, to occur with an application of either of those two chemicals. So again, one to five part per million works great. Uh, if you haven't, there is cultivar variations that go on. Start a small trial. Most growers in North Carolina, three part per million is where they, if, if, if they're going to start playing with it, if, that's their go-to number. You might go two and a half uh, for your, your operation, um, but in this case here, you probably don't need to lower the dose because we're not talking about growth control, we're talking about growth stimulation. So I would, contrary to that earlier slide of halving it, I don't think I would half it for northern growers. Uh, I would start in the two and a half to five part per million. 10, I wouldn't go to 10. I made a recommendation once and um, uh, it didn't work very well. You got, they got a lot of growth. So they had to come back and do another PGR application. So uh, five, five sometimes will work. So that's, that's where my comfort zone is. Don't go over that and call me and tell me that, that it's been overdosed. So anyway, that, that works great. Just to show you some slides, this came out of a, uh, we had a slightly different variation. These were 
in the study, but these were the control plants. So you can see here with applications, and by the way, these were applied twice. The untreated control is on the left, and then we had one part per million, three and six. So again, they were it was applied twice. That you can see compared to the plant that is on the left, we we got a stimulation of growth going on. So um, does it like stretch right out, like you're pulling it out of a hat? No, it has to grow into that. So you gotta allow enough time for that to actually occur. So that was probably uh, uh, about three, four weeks after the application, the last application occurred to kind of size them up. So you can size the plants up, uh, uh, to get a little more size if the plants have stalled on you. Uh, here's a little growth uh, stimulation that went on with these uh, violas. Uh, you can see most of its diameter, not much height. There is a little there, but not much, but you don't expect a lot of height variation going on with a viola unless you stretch it too far. Here's some work we did this past spring. And the purpose here was to nail the plants with an overdose application of paclobutrazole. In the case here, all the plants received eight parts per million. So you can see the plants that are all the way over at the left. Those plants received the eight parts per million of paclobutrazole and it, they got nailed. You can see the lack of flowering, the smaller plant size. So a classic overdose, oops, I, I went too high. So then we went through and we did a foliar spray of fresco at either two and a half, five or 10 part per million. And you can see going across the board that just as low as two and a half part per million made a significant difference of nothing else on flowering that went on with the plants. And you can see further growth control that went on further to the right. And so um, uh, it works. So if you have overdose, this is your go-to set of chemicals to, to overcome uh, the situation and get the plants blooming so you can get them sold and out the door. Uh, in this case, 10 didn't work too badly, but boy, I would, I, I would gain experience before I go there on a large extent of the crop. Here's what happens if you go too high. Now they were playing with this and they hit the plant on the right with the, uh, the box around it with excessive amounts. Those two were, should have been similar. So uh, you can overdo it and what's gonna stretch? It's gonna be the new growth. If the inner node's already, already set and stretched, you're not gonna stretch it. But if this next one is, is still growing, that's the one that you can make excessively high. So uh, you don't, so, so these applications, when you have a terminal bud like this plant, the only thing you can do is, is a, a attempt to stretch the plants, that the ones, the, the part of the stem that hasn't stretched in between the bud. That's all you have to play with. So like on a poinsettia, late season stretch control, how, how much internode elongation can you actually affect? And so uh, you gotta start early enough if you're seeing there's somewhat of a problem going on. And you can see here even, th it's the same plant. I just grew it on out to see what the effects were. I mean, it, let's just call it, it's a very airy plant, but it, you know, in some cases it probably could be sold, uh, but you, you have so much more growth. If you're shipping them, it's hard to, uh, uh, get, get economically get them on uh, a cart and ship them because you might lose another set of shelves. So anyway, you can get that stretch going on. Here's on some of the excessive rates on that earlier study that we were looking at uh, trying to stimulate growth. If you get too much growth, you, you kind of get, as you can see there with those plants, uh, the, with that plant, more uh, chlorotic looking plants. Uh, so if you get the rate a little too high, that was 10 parts per million, or no, it was six twice. So you can see that you might have to come in maybe with some Epsom salts to try to green them up a little more if that's the case. But but that that's that shows the extent of going a little too high on those rates. And then to throw in excessive rates, um, this occurred this past fall. Luckily, it was a spill from the concentrate bucket. They were running it on the boom in the back. And so, of course, they're running it through the injector at 1 to 100. So that meant the three part per million, 
that they're looking at to apply to the poinsettias, uh, this plant got a 300 part per million dose. So you can see that it works. It works really well, but uh, that's not what they wanted. There were only like four plants that got sp it got spilled on, but you can see the effect. Um, there was a case a few years ago when the grower wanted to have the combination product and they did the straight GA3 and the entire crop was that way. It was, it was not a pretty sight. So you will get growth, but you don't want that much growth to, to end up ruining your crop. So when you look at things, um, if you have too high of a rate, you can get an undesirable stretch. If things are getting out of control, you can reapply an, an, another application of anti gibberellin PGR. So what I mean, like paclobutrazol, dimenazide, so, or picolotenic C. So you can check the growth again. Now, the chemical companies love it. I had too much applied, it stalled. I applied Fresco, I got too much, and now you have to come back again. But I'm, I'm kind of poking at them from that standpoint. But you can come back in with a very low dose application to check it if, if you do mess up on the other end. So it's the fix to the fix. So um, it's a little extreme, but you can end up doing that. Now on poinsettias and some other crops, um, and there hasn't been as much work on other crops, drenches work very well. On poinsettias in particular, Drenches had the advantage that some of the cultivars are sensitive to sprays and can have distorted growth and delay of flowering. And you don't seem to get that with the drench. The drench rates are very similar. You're talking in the, the, the two to three part per million range. And so it, it works, but you're gonna be applying more chemical per pot. Uh, but probably for poinsettias, it's still the preferred method to go with on uh, stimulating growth. And so if you do overdo it, you can get the bleaching or greening occurring on the plants if you do go too high. What do I mean by that? Here's a case of, of some plants from this last fall. The, the, the plants were short, they were trying to stimulate growth and they did multiple applications. And you can especially see on the pink one on the left, the, the amount of greening that's there on that plant. Um, so it's, it's, it's very excessive. So, so you, you won't get the full coloration going on. And then on the plants on the right, uh, you, you get more of a bleaching effect that goes on. So that's, that's the other factor. Uh, if you, for foliar sprays, you can run into problems for poinsettias. So the take home here is if you're needing to stimulate growth, either a PGR overdose or the plants are too small and you need them bigger because you've had too much cloudy weather, uh, you can come in with a fresco or fascination foliar spray. Keep in mind, you're gonna need that two to three weeks of time to get them to grow up to the size you need it. And it can be done, but it, it's not like you can, I got three days to make specs. It ain't, it ain't, it's not gonna happen at that time frame. So you gotta have um, the possibility that the plant can grow and you gotta have the possibility that if it's a plant that has a set bud, that you, there's some nodes there that you can end up stretching. Uh, so those are, those are the two take homes to think about, uh, but it's a great application that you might find useful. It does not substitute for good growing, but it, it's a tool to help overcome some problems with your crop. So then let's shift gears a little of looking at uh, late season applications and things to think about because you know you you've applied PGRs maybe on the low side, uh, not knowing what the weather's going to be. Then, then all of a sudden it turns hot and sunny for a week and you get stretch going on. What can you end up doing? That, that's really kind of the question we're looking at here. And so this is what, you, this is what you're gonna be facing next month, basically is what's going to happen here. So can you do late season drenches at low doses to work? And so we did some, some, a small study here. We had some bubble gum cuttings and you can see the stage development that was here uh, when we applied the PGR. Now, after two, 
two weeks after that application, you can see here that we the plant in the upper um, left has no PGR applied. This one had piccolo at two part per million. It was piccolo 10XC. So it's, it's you know, there might be a little growth control there, but not much. But at the four part per million, you can see that things are more controlled. And so the, the effects there are, are good for the control of the plant. After five weeks, the same set of treatments. So really here we're needing probably the four part per million when you look there at the bottom plant. Um, it's nice compact um, and, and what you're doing is you're holding everything together. I, if you counted flowers, they probably had the same number, uh, but it just, they're not spread out. There's not the green foliage like you see in here occurring with this plant here. And so um, the, the, the next one is showing it uh, uh, if it was applied twice, and so you can see even more growth. And then I have the combination here with the two, two applications that really got it taken care of. So something like Paclobutrazole, Piccolo 10XC, you can apply it as a drench. You can, it, there's a chem, chemigation label for it. And so even though we're only doing top shots, there was a photograph a few years ago that Jim Barrett had, and it was the cascading effect and the color with the extra blooms that came out of that plant. And people can see it was a far superior plant compared to the untreated that had all the straggly green leaves in the, in the stretch. You're just toning it down. So drenches, you now these are North Carolina rates, so you probably want to half them. But a drench like this, especially for a very vigorous plant like bubble gum, worked very well, toning that plant and making it look nicer. And the consumer is going to like it too, because what happens with PGR application, because it, it also affects in the biochemical pathway, the stomates, you have less water loss through the leaves, which means the plant will last longer between irrigations and that will make the consumer happy that it's not drying down as often. And also during production, you're gonna to have to irrigate it less. So there's a win-win for you as a grower and for the end consumer. So consider some of these drenches for some very aggressive type items. Now, if we're looking at things in a combination pot uh, instead, you're probably going to have to go into liner soaks uh, as far as what's going on and applying those early and controlling that growth as it goes. That, that gets a little tougher if you have a combination pot and some things need it and some things don't uh, to get that done. So on late season uh, drenches, target for Paclobutrazole, um, probably one to four part per million. For northern growers like Michigan, I, I would try one to two. Um, when you you look at the the effectiveness of some of the other chemicals, specifically fluoroprimidol, is top floor. Uh, if you remember on that earlier slide, it was lined up with Paclo as activity being similar as a spray, but when it went to a drench, it has more activity, and so. Fluoroprimidol has better uh, uh, soil substrate application efficacy. Uh, it is on par with uniconazole and like Sumagic or Concise. The advantage is there's a cost advantage that goes on there now of using top floor. Now comparing it with, with Paclobutrazole, it's gonna really get down to the rate. Uh, there's more competition in the Paclobutrazole market. And so you're gonna be hard pressed to beat uh, a Paclobutrazole application based on price. You might find a chemical works better and, you, and that change, you might make the change to that other chemical because of that. Um, you know, Uniconazole, where, where does it really do well? It, that 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 chemical is really good on on perennials um, so that's kind of some of the balancing acts when you're trying to pick out some of these pgrs and matching up which one you might have now when you're looking at a drench application it it has less effect on flowering the plants will flower now if you get too high you're going to nail them of course that's the case but on a on a good targeted rate that's in the recommendations 
you're going to, you're going to have the flower production. The flower power is going to be there to sell, but you're going to have to make the application early enough to prevent that stretch. And, and it will improve the flower power, like I said, because the flowers are out front and there's no leaves covering it up the, and it just looks nicer. So it's really something to consider for your operation uh, this spring, especially for some of the hanging baskets. So, so just a few other comments to make of some prior work to keep in mind, because you're gonna have to make decisions based on your growing conditions and the plants. The excellent work that was done by Jim Barrett with Paclobutrazol, so Bonsai, uh, Piccolo 10 XC, um, he was using a very low dose drench, a 0 0.1 part per million drench. And so he found on poinsettias, he got about two weeks of growth control. So at this rate, it's pretty darn dirt, dirt cheap. You can do chemigation. So it's something to think about. It's labeled for the use of this. Do I know the exact rates? No, but man, that this, this is what I, I go to for recommendation. So it's something to consider trying that you're just going to, you're just going to stall them and then they're going to grow out. So don't do it on super sensitive cultivars, but something that you might want to consider for a go-to rate to do some testing for your operation, that works great. The other thing is CPRO a few years ago looked at a retail cocktail. So for annuals, that was a foliar spray of four to eight part millions, ARAS plus 1,250 to 2,500 B9. Perennials a little higher. And so they found that for a retail setting, that if you were going to get into a rainy weekend and things were going to stretch, that, that a, a, a garden center type situation could do this foliar spray, hold down most of the plants and get a little control that then ultimately would wear off because both of those chemicals are relatively mild. And so that might be another approach, especially with northern climate growers, to end up using more towards the end of production uh, versus the 0.1 part per million paclobutrazol. So those are other tools that are, are rates you might want to consider playing with for your operation. So Let's now move on to a little balancing act that needs to be considered. And that is a balancing act between phosphorus and your PGRs. So, and so the question comes in, if you limit your phosphorus amount, how does it affect your PGR rate? So we did a series of experiments that from some uh, a grant that was funded by the Fred C. Klockner Foundation. And this is a summation of pulling out just some of uh, Josh Henry's work. And so I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, of this information along with, with PGR growth control. And it's directly applicable to what would be happening in your greenhouse. So here's some of the results that you can see on petunias, the price sky blue, that as we, we increase the, the phosphorus rate, uh, you had a difference in plant growth. And so basically when you, you got to the point of about four part per million, the growth kind of peaked, it plateaued there. Now normally on plant growth, we expect it ultimately to go down at 80 part per million. It didn't get there, but, but we did see a, a basically a, a, in, a, a linear uh, increase than a plateau occurring on those plants. Here's just another top view that you can kind of see what was going on with those plants as phosphorus rate increased. So when he did the statistics, it came into that linear plateau approach of looking at plotting the, the, the information. So if we use the standard quadratic, we would have recommended roughly a rate, a uh, rate difference of of 48 part per million, but by doing the linear plateau, we were down closer to, to nine part per million. So basically above nine part per million, you don't see as much additional growth control occurring with the plant. So, so you're basically wasting phosphorus for what's going on. And that's basically a 4X difference. And so when you looked at the, the, the tissue concentration at the line at the cutting it at 8.72 part per million, what you see at the top end is 
um, sorry, went too fast. You basically, the area that's up here, it just luxurious consumption of phosphorus that gets incorporated. And so th this, is, this is suitable for maximizing growth at this, this level and the rest is just too much phosphorus because one and a half percent would be considered very high, even 1.25. Usually you're looking at 0.2 as being the deficiency in most cases and uh, 0.8 being the upper limit on, on many cases. So the plant will take up some of it, but what you really get is stretch going on that plant. So you don't really need it. So you're, you're putting money into something that's not required. Here's alternate thera that you can see the also same effect going on of increasing in growth and then at plateauing. We also saw a coloration difference on, on the red foliage varieties that you have more intense red coloration going on. If you get the rate too high, the plant ends up having more green coloration going on. The same thing with zonal geraniums, in this case seed geraniums, that you can see the zonation changed on the plant from here being more chocolate, it's still occurring, but then it starts to fade as the rate starts getting up towards 20 parts per million. And you can see it a little better here when he pulled off the leaves, the banding is much greater at lower phosphorus levels in that plant. He also did uh, some, some work with um, uh, peppers. So you can see here that this was continually fertilized with phosphorus from zero to 20 part per million on the top row. The bottom row, we went halfway through the season, then stopped phosphorus fertilization. You can see no phosphorus, especially at fruiting, is very stat disastrous, but at 10 part per million, you can get some good growth control. You don't need any additional phosphorus at 20 part per million. You're just wasting your money. So in reality, when you started looking at the, the point where growth was maximized for most species, and the list is there, we reported in a series of Grower Talk articles in the fall, that five to 15 part per million phosphorus is really the point where growth stops getting any bigger. So if you go too low at, at two and a half part per million, you're usually going to get stunted growth and deficiency symptoms. So if your, your objective is to control growth, three to five parts per million is, is probably the target amount that you, you should be looking at for controlling growth. There, there's a little playing there that you have to go through. So when you look at fertilizers, what do they supply in phosphorus? And that's what this graphic is here, that as you increase the rate of fertilizer from uh, zero to 200 part per million, and based on a line is the type of fertilizer that you'd be using. When do you cross the line above the 15 part per million? Well, you never do with 13,213, but at, with 15,515, you cross the line about, that's probably about 105, 108. With 201020, you're somewhere in the 65 part per million. And with triple 20 here, you're down, I guess, about 38 part per million. And so if you go beyond that, with nitrogen rate, um, then you're adding too much phosphorus and then you're getting stretch occurring in those plants. So we did look at trying to play around a little with um, rates of phosphorus and how they compared and that's what Josh did as part of his study. So we did New Guinea and patients at uh, only two rates, zero and 20. After several weeks, half were sprayed with pack low, and then we measured different growth diameters uh, along the way. So here's what we found. So when you use plant growth regulators, uh, as the rate of phosphorus increased down here at the bottom, you can see that, that they're smaller with no matter what, with um, uh, lower phosphorus. But if you use no PGRs, in the case here, and you fertilize with somewhere between five and 10 part per million, you still got the growth uh, with that plant. And so you didn't have to use the plant growth regulator because you got the growth factor going on uh, without having to use the PGR effect. And so here's a close up, uh, you know, the, the plant with 20 part per million probably on a dry weight basis is a little bigger, but you can see that you could, you could grow with 20 part per million P and apply the PGR and get growth control. 
or you could go with no PGR and go with the lower rate of phosphorus. So it's gonna vary a little with cultivars and different species, but that gives you an idea of what's going on with growth control for those plants. And so here's the graphic basically that, that Josh had, uh, that if you really start looking at comparing the growth between the no PGR, which is this line here with the black dots versus the open circles is with the PGR. Where does, where does the rate at 10 part per million kind of line up? You're looking at, uh, well, uh, where does the rate line up? It's, it's about five part per million phosphorus uh, would be co comparable. So you can, basically it's this number up here, the similar height between the two plants. So you can get away with, uh, with going with a low phosphorus routine in some cases. So depending on the species for the take home, targeting five to 15 part per million is where you wanna be. If you're gonna go for growth control, that three to five, you're probably gonna have to be at five part per million. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're irrigating less up in the north, uh, on a weekly basis, that means you're applying less phosphorus per week to boot. And so you probably need to go closer to that five rate than, than with the potential of, of running a nutrient deficiency. You know, the other thing we saw that if you're gonna do something like this, you, you give phosphorus the first half of the crop to kind of get it up in size and then you can cut back and kind of control it. And then you don't run into the problem of deficiencies as pre being prevalent, but more importantly, you've already got the size there and now you just got to hold it and finish it versus you still got to push it all the way through to the end of production. And you might get, you might come up with the plant too small. So beef it up, hold it, uh, might be a better approach. And so it does work uh, as effectively for a PGR application strategy for what you might have. So with that, that is the, the slides that I was gonna to show today, looking at some of the aspects that I thought that you can use at this point with your production in the North. So we do wanna thank the, uh, the fine group of people who have supported the program here at NC State. We get a lot of cuttings from Doom and Orange. PGR is from Fine, Proven Winners gives cuttings. Uh, we've been doing some work on tobacco and we get substrates from Old Castle and SunGrow and then funding from the American Floral Endowment, the Horticulture Research Institute and the Fred C. Klockner Foundation. So with that, I wanna thank you for attending and remember the, the eGrow newsletter comes out, the alert, there's the website, e-grow.org, click on alert, the subscribe tab will come up and you can subscribe if you're not at this point. So with that, I will open it up for questions, Herr Owen.